Welcome back to Careers Explained. Today, we're talking with Chris Tapia about his career path and current role. He received his undergraduate degree from Duke University in mechanical engineering and his MBA from MIT. Since then, he's worked at Kearney, the North Highland Company, and Data Ventures, and is currently a strategy principal director at Accenture. Welcome, Chris, and thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me, Heidi. So over those roles that you've had before your current role at Accenture, can you talk about the biggest factors you learned you did and didn't want in a job? Sure. That's an excellent question. I guess the biggest thing I wanted was variety and challenge. It's one of the things that led me to choose to work in management consulting after graduating from MIT Sloan. Uh, and I, uh, I started, as you noted, at Kearney uh, due to the opportunity to work for a large consulting firm, get that variety that everybody looks for often after either undergrad or completing their MBA. And I was intrigued by also the type of people. Some of the things that I didn't want over time really focused on the culture. The culture at Kearney was great. The culture at uh, some of the clients, I guess, as a consultant, you get to see a variety of clients. And some of the clients I worked with, you'd see the culture was fantastic. And other ones, it was the type of place that you were glad that you were consulting. You could work there for three or six months, but then move on to another cl client and another opportunity. And can you describe kind of what that culture was you did want? You, what was great about Carney, for example? Yeah, so Carney, uh, like many consulting firms, has a strong mentorship model. But definitely felt like the people there cared about it and weren't doing it just to check the box. And that's something also kind of that resonated when I spoke about good cl clients that also had that good mentorship model. Those that you felt cared about the individuals that they were mentoring and coaching versus those that were doing it just because it was an ancillary responsibility. Gotcha. And then from those roles, what made you switch when you did between them? Sure. So I guess first as a... Uh, you know, management consulting at Kearney, I was there for a decade. I was able to kind of move up the ladder and seek greater and greater opportunities and responsibilities and found it to be a, a fantastic place. I made the decision to kind of move on from Kearney, mostly because of a lifestyle standpoint. I was there from 2000 to 2010, which was still back in the days of, you know, being on the road four days a week or more. Um, so has, you know, when you're early in your career, it's a fantastic opportunity to, you know, get those frequent flyer miles and check out different cities. But over time, it can be a little bit challenging. I mean, don't get me wrong. It was fantastic. I had the opportunity to go to many different countries and travel around a lot of our uh, great United States. But on the other hand, at some point in life, we all want to uh, maybe settle down and at least travel a little bit less. So that was a, one reason to uh, switch from Kearney. But overall, it was a fantastic career opportunity and a fest that Fantastic learning opportunity for me. And then from your other jobs, was it also lifestyle factors or other? Uh, so, yeah, great question. So initially it was lifestyle factors and then it was just seeking additional challenges. So, um, you know, the second consulting firm I worked with North Highland was also a great firm to work at. Uh, but over time, I was looking for something that really would let me specialize a little bit. And I had that opportunity with a to work in a niche firm where I was one of the leaders at this niche firm as we looked to build up not only their capabilities, but their client base. So I had a good uh, six years there uh, pre and during COVID to expand their sales globally and expand their client base. Um, but over time, learned that uh, there's some fantastic things to work in a niche firm and there are other things that lead to you desire kind of broader opportunities. And then from that firm, how did you get to your current role at Accenture? Yeah, so uh, I guess things changed a little bit from that time period of uh, pre-COVID and during COVID and post-COVID that we're at right now. And having known that the consulting model had changed a little bit, depend upon the client, depend upon one's role in, at a consulting firm, I knew that the lifestyle wasn't quite as demanding as from a time on the road standpoint, at least. Uh, that, that had changed from when I left Carney to 2022 when I was starting to seek other opportunities. Um, so I started to look at a lot of the large consulting firms. As a uh, someone who works in management consulting, you uh, end up having a network that ends up being spread out around many of those different firms. So kind of was talking to many uh, former colleagues and clients of mine that were at uh, many large consulting firms and really 
reinvigorated that network, but also talked to them to understand more about the individual cultures about not only the firm overall, but the specific practices within the firms. Because as we talk about many of these firms, uh, including my current employer, many of them are pretty large global organizations. And within those organizations, you're going to have a, a smaller group of people that you'll work with on a regular basis. So I wanted to really get to know the people that I'd be working with more closely and understand kind of that particular practice and how it aligned with my specialties, capabilities, and interests. Good. You did your due diligence. And then with that big network, you're talking to multiple firms and practices. How did you narrow in what was the best fit? What were you looking for that led you to this role specifically? Yeah, I think uh, it kind of aligns with some of the earlier comments I made about Carney, but getting to know the the, the people specifically that you work with closely on a regular basis, you know, as a uh, consulting is both an individual effort, but it's really a team sport. You're playing with a group of people on a regular basis, both on the projects that you're delivering on, on the sales opportunities you're pursuing, and then even the internal firm development efforts you do, whether it's, you know, coaching people or intellectual capital development or whatever it may be quite often you're working with the same group of people pretty regularly. So trying to get to know those people, even do due diligence about those people if you didn't know them previously. You know, so many people I was networking with, I knew from my pet earlier in my career, but many people I didn't, but somebody I knew did. So using those kind of connections or that next degree of separation and talking to those people and get to understand more about those individuals that you'd be working closely with. So really prioritizing the people almost over kind of your specialty or would you say equal prioritization? Uh, pretty equally, but I think the people part is so important. I think no matter where you are in career, your career, who you're getting advice from, who you're working with, there's always an opportunity to continue to learn. That's really something that I've always wanted to do throughout my life. Uh, and even you know now at a more advanced stage in my career, I'm still always interested in learning. And the best way to learn is from the people you're working with. Yeah, it's something about kind of the, the people around you through osmosis. You can either get smarter or dumber through <laughs> yeah. it. So yeah. then now can you give an overview of what you do, what your role is? Yeah, so as you mentioned, I'm uh, I'm in the retail strategy practice. So work with a large range of retailers. I've been doing that for, I guess, since I started at Kearney, really back it's over 20 years ago now. I've been pretty much focused in the retail and CPG industry. Uh, for those that don't know it, I guess CPG stands for Consumer Packaged Goods. So it's a range of products that you're pretty much buying at your grocery store or convenience store or big box retailer. So I've been focused in that, those areas for 20 plus years now. Um, in my current role, I'm focused primarily in retail, although I do also work with some of our uh, CPG teams. And my main client right now is an apparel retailer. I've been working for about the last seven plus months helping them on an inventory optimization and improvement opportunity. Uh, we've been actually working with them for a couple of years now. Um, but overall, I work across the retail spectrum from apparel retailer to big box retail, grocery convenience, et cetera. So working in retail and what does it mean to be a strategy principal director? <laughs> yeah, a lot of words and makes it hard to say your title when you're talking to people. <laughs> but basically it means you're either you're doing a combination of things. One is leading large scale projects. Um, from a strategy standpoint though, it's usually earlier on in the effort with a new client or an existing client, but it may be a, a new, either a future strategy that they want to help you, your help in designing and, or they may have an initial idea, but they really need to hone in on that, get the detail around it as they prepare for implementation. Um, as far as principal director, I guess it just is a direction of a level of seniority, but also that you have a lot of responsibility beyond the project management. You're developing client relationships, managing those client relationships, seeking additional opportunities, and, and coaching younger team members. Super helpful overview. And then when you talk about strategy for a project, can you give some examples of types of projects or problems that a customer might come to you with? Sure. Um, so as an example, um, some efforts were um, 
currently working on as far as business development opportunities include a number of clients realize that their supply chain network strategy. And what that means, I guess, is those who aren't really know supply chain that well, is there's a range of ways that a product gets from where it's manufactured to the end store that you're shopping at, you know, whether it's a grocery store, an apparel store, or whatever kind of store it is. So how does it get from whether it's made, manufactured in the U.S. or manufactured overseas, how does it get from there to the end store or to a fulfillment center if it may be an e-commerce product? So there's, it sounds simple, but there's many different ways that that product can get from point A to point D or E or F in that value chain. So many clients now in this post-COVID world are re-looking at their strategy to understand the best way to flow that product, the best way that their network should look, how that product's handled, et cetera, trying to figure out the best way to maximize the efficiency of getting that product to the customer, minimizing the inventory, and thinking about cost throughout. Thank you for that, Ori. That makes much more clear than the original title, and I think that's helpful for people. Yeah. So then kind of rewinding back, you've worked in with retailers for over, almost 20 years, what are the steps to get into this type of role? You've been kind of in consulting jobs, but generally, what are the typical steps? Yeah, so I guess early on in like figuring out if A, you want to be in consulting, and then B, how you get in, into that role really starts with you know understanding what interests you the most. I think early on, people in their career, at least individuals like myself, seek variety, seek challenge, seek the opportunity to continuously learn. If those are some of the characteristics that describe you, consulting is a great opportunity for that. I described it that I went in, I was very interested in kind of supply chain and operations, the, the way to efficiently move things. So that's one of the things that attracted me about Carney. But while there, I didn't know I was definitely going to be kind of a retail consumer products guy when I joined that. I just kind of that developed over time, ended up on a few of those projects, enjoyed the people I was working with really found it pretty tangible as many of us can as consumers because we all are consumers to some degree. Um, so enjoyed the work and then kind of developed that specialty from an industry standpoint over time. Um, but I think if you kind of understand those characteristics of who you are and what you enjoy, that helps you kind of hone in on the broader industry. And then from a standpoint of getting into the role, I think it's you know, like so many things, but doing your initial research, understanding what skills you have that are transferable, uh, recognizing that, I think as I describe it, and initially many people think, oh, you have to have an MBA or you have to have been an engineer or you have to have been a business major. And that's not necessarily true. You know, you can take, uh, I know obviously that uh, you're coming from Davidson, a liberal arts school, and but many of the people I worked with, you know, were very different range of majors, but they had some of those same skills from being analytical in nature and driven and the type that wanted to solve different problems and challenges that ended up being very successful as management consultants. And when you were just figuring out what was your big interest, you mentioned you knew you were interested in supply chain. What interested you out of all the other consulting fields? Um. So kind of ironically, you mentioned kind of kicking us off as a mechanical engineer. Um, yeah. For anybody that knows me, I'm a mechanical engineer, but I cannot fix anything. I'm very, I guess, theoretical as an engineer. I did well in getting my degree and all, but I, I'm not the type that can fix a thing. <laughs> um, so, but yet, you know, in supply chain, it means, you know, I've described kind of a very high level of the movement of products. And then you can be within a distribution center and trying to think about process efficiencies or in a manufacturing plant and trying to think of how you drive efficiencies in, in that operation. The theoretical and the mathematical parts have always been the way my mind works, but not necessarily my hands don't go with it. So uh, you're the director, not the instrumentalist. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and so what does a typical day look like for you in this role? Great question. So yeah, um, kind of that point we touched on before, the, the role obviously changes over time. You can be at the same uh, consulting firm for 20 plus years, or in the case of my example, kind of bounce around a little bit from three or four different firms over time. Um, at this point in my career, my typical day is primarily focused on the client that I'm spending you know 80 to 100% of my day on but not 100%. So 
typical day, majority of it will be working with the project team. That project team is comprised of both individuals from Accenture as well as a client team and you know managing the overall project sometimes it's tactical meetings sometimes it's more strategic ones on things that we want, want to change or improve you know a week out a month out three months out and sometimes it's you know tactical things of things we need to change or the team needs to change tomorrow um but in addition it's combined with some of those other uh responsibilities that can can include include things like coaching and mentoring of both team members or other individuals within the firm it can include broader strategy meetings about the practice overall as far as the retail strategy practice and then include time spent on either intellectual capital development which is a fancy word to say you know the, the thought products that we as accenture or as other consulting firms are developing that then help in sales pitches and that's the last part of the day i guess would be you know working on some business development opportunities now that would be if everything is comprised in a particular day obviously in the course of a week or a month you know some days are heavier um 100 on the client side and others days maybe a little bit more of a mix of some of those other responsibilities and so the number of clients that you're working on at a given time would probably vary depending on the practice and the team for you, you're working at kind of one at a time right now, longer term. What's the typical turnaround time of one client project? I think the typical turnaround time is usually about three months. It's okay. a kind of two to four months in that range. Over the course of my career, if I go back to the uh, three large consulting firms I worked at, I think the longest engagement I was on was under, under but close to a year. And the shortest would have been a month with the, yeah. the typical kind of being in the three to four month range. Um, there are definitely a few clients where it might be that, you know, you do a three month project and a three month follow on and then four month follow on after that. So when you combine it, it ends up being around a year, but it's usually a few different phases that you didn't know when you're necessarily uh, signing up for that project and being <laughs> convinced by the uh, principal director or managing director or partner that was uh, having you on that firm that you necessarily would be going to that uh particularly random town for for 12 months at a time so a little arm twisting going on there <laughs> exactly no and for different projects is there a typical pipeline of how you approach it phases that you work through starting with strategy then execution anything like that that's standard yeah I mean there's relatively standard um I'd say you know across probably 80 percent of the projects there's a a standard um you know six to eight week assessment that may be happening and then a two to three month design phase followed by some level of maybe initial implementation and then maybe a more detailed implementation that can or may or may not I guess include the same team members you know, so sometimes, uh, particularly dependent upon the various firms I've worked at, sometimes it's the same team that runs it on for the next phase, and sometimes it's a, it's a new team dependent upon the real requirements of that next phase. And can you give a hypothetical or anonymous real example of, in each of those phases, what that looks like when you're doing an assessment, what that entails, what a design kind of build out would entail? Sure. I'll give a, a theoretical one from what not necessarily my current client, but an earlier client in my career. But um, so I guess it starts usually with the, the business development process itself. So you may have a client relationship or somebody within the firm, you know, maybe somebody's more senior in the firm has a particular client relationship. So you get invited to propose. Um, and that may be, you know, a big competitive uh, RFP, which you know, request for a proposal, or maybe just a you know great relationship that you have and it's not competitive. But you, you know, the client has a problem and they need assistance in that problem. So you propose on how your firm's gonna assist them in that problem. So you get past that stage and everybody's happy, right? You get the contract. Um, so that initial phase though of you know six to 12 weeks is going to be some diagnostic and assessment of quantifying really what that particular opportunity is. So the client knows they need a new strategy to um, be implemented maybe after some merger, right? So they just merge with another company. It could be a merger equals or they acquired a small company that's you know 10% their size. But because of that, uh, in this example, they know they need to relook at their supply chain because it's big enough in scale that it's going to need to change the way they think they work things right now. 
Um, so in that you know initial assessment, you're going to do a whole bunch of data collection, um, understanding a lot of things about you know if this is a supply chain project, what the network is and what the the product mix is and how things are going to change based on this new acquisition that maybe. Um, so a whole bunch of data collection and initial high level analysis to put together some degree of change, essentially what what at a very high level of magnitude, what would that change look like? Um, get to a point in the process here where you'll get some of the uh, client team members and the client executives to agree or disagree with where you're heading, um, you know, really collaborate in that process um, to come to an overall kind of end of assessment recommendation of, of what needs to change and what a next phase would look like. So that's kind of a high level assessment of what's the current state look like, what are the real gaps between where they are now and what needs to happen in the future based on, in this example, a you know theoretical acquisition. Super helpful overview there. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. And then what do you like about the role? It sounds like kind of the diversity, the things you originally were looking for, but maybe others that vary. And then what do you find challenging? So what I like about the role is definitely the diversity of work, the teamwork, that it's a you know collaborative effort. Um, and that's really been, you know, throughout all the uh, experiences that I've had, but that that opportunity to really um, collaborate and see opportunities through. So some of the projects I've enjoyed the most, um, you know, obviously we've been talking pretty theoretical in some of these examples, but are the ones where you really get to see that initial strategy phase, but see the client, you know, nodding their heads at you, you know, telling you they're in agreement and signing up for the next phase and not necessarily from, yes, it's obviously great from a contract standpoint for the firm and for an individual, et cetera, but it's really the excitement that they're buying into your strategy that you and your team and the client team have come together to develop and recommend and moving on to the next phase and seeing it through to the next phase. And then really those client relationships that I've you know, maintained for a while where you kind of see years later, the client is still using the recommendation that you put through. That's great to see the fulfillment you're helping. You're not just- Exactly. The actual yeah. impact. Exactly. And anything you find challenging about the role? I mean, there's definitely lifestyle demands as, uh, you know, many careers nowadays, but definitely from a, whenever you're in a job, whether it's consulting or something else, that's client service, you know, at the end of the day, clients come first, right? So there may be times in your life and, uh, you know, we all, you know, I think try to achieve work-life balance and whether that's uh, feasible or not. I know many people have different perspectives of those words and, you know, whether it's balance or a different word that uh, should be applied, but um you know, finding that and managing that really comes with, I think, being some key words there as far as it's not just the firm can't do it for you. And that's no, no matter what firm it is, it's whether you're, you're my current employer or a different employer, it really is that combination of the individual uh, developing what those priorities are and how they're going to work it through. And then recognizing that there's going to be exceptions, right, where you, you, you set your priorities and you may have your you know, whatever personal boundaries that you have, but there's going to be occasions where you're in client service and the client, you know, adjusted a meeting date that happens to conflict with something and then it becomes your own prioritization of how important um, those particular things are and when when do you balance and when do you, uh, when do you pull up the, the white flag, so. And with that topic of work-life balance, what are your typical hours in a week? Uh, typical hours are probably around, I'd say around 50 hours a week. It's nothing too demanding. Earlier in my career, it was more. Um, earlier in career, particularly when it was more travel involved. Uh, right now, I haven't had to travel as much uh, in the last uh, nine months or really the last three years, I guess. <laughs> There's been some, but uh, as somebody who uh, literally returned um, from overseas the day the uh, the U.S. kind of shut down, uh, I, I've had to experience a range of travel in my lifetime, but uh, more, more recently it's been less travel. Um, and the hours are to some degree, you know, we all work hours that uh, fit our lifestyle, meaning, you know, may shut it down and you know, five or 6 p.m. because of a personal commitment and then, you know, turn on the computer for an hour late night or hour or extra early in the morning because of, you know, you've got deliverables to do or calls to make. A little bit of flexibility there with the- high Exactly, day. exactly. 
And also on the collaborative front of the job, what percentage of time would you say is spent working with people versus doing something on your own? Um, I'd say right now it's probably, you know, 70, 80% of my day is working with other people. Um, there's, you know, yes, certain times where I'm, you know, working on a particular spreadsheet or client presentation, but most of the time it's in either in meetings with other people or in a, you know, whiteboarding session, whether in person or a virtual one uh, nowadays, but brainstorming through um, something with either team members or client team members or, or peers throughout the firm. Very social job. <laughs> yes, yeah, it definitely is is that even though right now it's social just like we're doing as far as across yeah. the computer stream quite often, but definitely a, a social and engaging uh profession. virtually social. <laughs> exactly. And finally, what advice do you have for someone who's interested in following your path into consulting? Sure, sure. I guess, you know, obviously early on, I think, and this this holds obviously without any profession, but just network and talk to people. And it sounds so, I don't know, superficial, but it really is useful throughout life. I think the more you can be comfortable with talking to people about different topics, you know, helps wherever you are. Um, and then thinking about that from the standpoint of it's not only at, you know, school career fairs or, you know, through family, friends, or whatever it may be, but there's always other opportunities, you know, opportunities through volunteer networks that you participate in, or, you know, athletic teams that you play on, or whatever it may be, you never know where you're going to meet that next person that has a common professional interest, and then that can take that from whether it's that individual or that next connection from that individual um, to continue to both net, to network and to learn. I, I honestly, it's something that I do on the side all the time now and it's not because I'm looking for another job or anything like that or even looking for additional you know business sale or whatever it may be it's really just that opportunity to continue to dialogue continue to have enriching discussions and to learn and then you never know when you're going to meet that next individual that's going to help you or you'll help them and on the networking front I want to dive a little bit into this because a lot of people say network for someone who's in college right now and just doesn't really get with that means can would you have any like specific questions what someone should ask in order to kind of use that well I think like early on I think it's fine to ask just some people some of the same questions you're asking me you know tell me about your typical day and what do you enjoy most about it and how did you get here I think many people like to talk about themselves many people love to talk about you know what they've learned and some of the challenges they faced so i think having that as you know yes it can be initially through an email but then a zoom call or you're meeting somebody over a coffee or a beverage um there's always the opportunity i think to get to understand them their path their likes and dislikes and then find out who they also recommend you talk to kind of it's always that game of spider web where it's you know one one step in the next to continue to to learn and, and meet more people thank you for that and thanks for coming on those are great insights and i think a lot of people are going to be interested in consulting after hearing your description of it well thanks for the time Heidi. <laughs>